My name is Pete Saltonstall. I own and operate King Ferry Winery, which is about 20 miles north of Ithaca on the east side of Cayuga Lake. I made this film to show people what this whole process of the hydrofracturing is about. This past year, I had the opportunity to fly over the gas fields in Pennsylvania. And what I saw instilled in me interest to learn a lot more about this whole process. We're following the Susquehanna River, and you'll see a number of well pads and sites that are right nearby the river. The river is needed, obviously, for the large amounts of water that are needed for the hydrofracturing of these wells. And so whether the water is either pumped in from the rivers, pumped into holding ponds, or actually trucked into the well sites, there are huge amounts of water. The scope and scale of this whole activity is tremendous. And one of the things that worries me is this is slated to come to my area of New York State and be allowed in the Marcellus Shale. And as you'll see from the film, uh, we'll be seeing gas pads under various stages of construction, pipelines uh, also under various stages of construction, lots of road construction into these pads. This activity is not the benign activity that the gas exploration has been in the past in upstate New York. These are horizontal hydrofracking uh, wells that are going to be used, different from the vertical wells that have been uh, used in upstate New York. And the number of them, they number in the thousands in Pennsylvania. So this is a whole different breed of cat from the drilling that has taken place in upstate New York. And I just made this film because I wanted people to see and recognize that, that this is totally different from what has occurred in upstate New York. What we're seeing right now is uh, gas line, pipeline construction, and you'll see different sites that are under construction, newly constructed. You'll see right-of-ways that have been created through these woods right here is, is a perfect example of one where there's a pipeline under construction, and there's a large clearing that's going through this uh, woodlot to create that pipeline. This is another uh, big area of construction I think a lot of people are not familiar with. So the wells have to be interconnected with their pipelines, which then is interconnected with larger pipelines, feeding ultimately to much larger pipelines to distribute the gas uh, nationwide. One of the things that is striking when you, when you view this from the air is the number of wells that you see in the, and the overall activity that is, is, exists there. There are thousands of wells that have been currently drilled in Pennsylvania. And when you see it from the air, you get a very clear idea of the scale and scope of it. it is, it's a heavy-duty industrial activity that's been transplanted to these rural areas. So the well sites are all over. They're too numerous to count, as a matter of fact. And it's, uh, it's, quite a, it's an eye-opener to see this uh, from the air. But the wells usually take up anywhere from the well pad, about five acres. When the well sites are constructed, there's a uh, membrane that's laid down over that large area. And again, whether that can all be removed, I'm not quite sure that that can happen. This shows a wetland right near a well site. One of the areas of debate currently going on, both in Pennsylvania and New York State, is how far should these well sites be from any water source? So whether it be a wetland, a stream, a river, town aquifer, or a person's individual water well. And those issues are uh, you know, hotly debated both in Pennsylvania and New York State right now. And as you'll see in this film, we'll see, we'll see a number of shots where the, uh, the wells are very close in proximity to the Susquehanna River. And that's clearly, it's not by accident because this allows the drillers to bring those massive amounts of water directly from the river to their well sites. So one of the challenges that I have when they come up to the Finger Lakes is that obviously the Finger Lakes would be a source of water uh, for these wells to be constructed and for the hydrofracturing. And one of the big areas of, of contention will be of how close should these wells be allowed to these wonderful lakes that we have in this area. There are many large ponds that you'll see in this video and newly constructed and they're very angular and square in shape or rectangular. But there are a number of uh, very large ponds that are both wastewater ponds 
and freshwater storage. Oftentimes, a different reading that I've done says that between three and five million gallons of water are used to hydrofracture one well, and you can have as many as 10 wells per site or per pad. There are a number of waste uh, lagoons that have been built in Pennsylvania. I've been told that these will not be allowed to be built in New York State. There's a lot of backflow, they would call it, that comes back up from this hydrofracturing process. And I uh, let people can look up the quantities, whether it's half the amount of water. They're just huge volumes of water and chemicals that come back up from the, the hydrofracturing. That water has to be dealt with and disposed of safely because it'll now contain the chemicals that are used. Salt from under, deep underground that's brought back up. And there are also some issues with, with radioactive elements uh, coming back up with this wastewater from deep underground. There have been some issues with those, uh, the liners of those ponds uh, leaking and having then that backflow, which will have the chemicals in it that have been used for the hydrofracturing, could get into the groundwater. So that practice, while it, was, while it was allowed in Pennsylvania, I believe that it is no longer allowed there now. There are a lot of quarries that have been under construction, and these quarries are used to generate the stone and crushed rock for the roadways. So that was something that I noticed you know, right off the bat, that if they're going to be building a road, they don't want to have to truck it great distances, the material. And so they will presumably pay a landowner for land and then uh, start a quarry so that they can have uh, crushed stone. In many respects, it's the countryside is similar to that around King Ferry. The hills, maybe it's a little bit more of a rolling topography and steeper topography than we have uh, around King Ferry, but it's uh, very similar in nature. Lots of small farms, probably a greater number of small farms down in this area of Pennsylvania than there are where we live. Obviously, there's been a tremendous consolidation of farms around King Ferry and in, certainly in southern Cuga County where we live. One of the other things that struck me uh, was the, the number of roads that, that are built. Obviously, if you have a, a well site, you have to have an access road into it. And some of these roads are quite, uh, quite long. And basically, uh, you know, they have to be built and constructed to carry heavy truck traffic. So these are substantial roadways that are built through, through the countryside from you know, an existing roadway out into wherever the well site is. These are tankers that are tanks that are brought in for the hydrofracking. Once the well has been drilled, then the hydrofracturing process starts. So they have to have a way of having you know, those millions of gallons on site of water. And then those are mixed with the chemicals and the sand to actually do the hydrofracking. So the wells are first obviously have to be drilled and prepared to be hydrofractured. So you'll see again all of these different processes, uh, you know, under construction from completed well sites to those under construction. When the wells are fractured, they are operating at pressures up to 13,000 pounds per square inch, which is very high pressure. And so the water and chemicals and sand are pumped underground at those pressures, which is quite remarkable. It should be noted that in, when the casings are prepared for these wells, there are multiple layers of steel casing, cement, steel casing, cement. And the hope and thought is, is that this is going to prevent any contamination of uh, surface or subsurface drinking water. It's predicated on the assumption that this, all of, these, all of this construction is going to be perfect every time over the course of thousands of wells that are constructed. So I always worry a little bit when somebody tells me that some process is absolute and there are never gonna be any mistakes made. It always troubles me a little bit. And I think of things like the Exxon Valdez and the BP oil spill in the Gulf. And certainly if there were a spill on a large scale in Pennsylvania and it got into the groundwater, one of the challenges is, is that there's no fixing that. It would just be a question is how much chemicals were spilled can they be diluted enough to not be toxic to people if it should get in their drinking water? But it's not something that can be gone in. You can't fix it, and you can stop it.
but if there is a leak or a spill, there it is. Another area that I'll talk about is that I, it's my hope in making this film. Again, I want to try to spur people's curiosity in this whole process. And there's so much propaganda out there on both sides of this issue. And my hope is, is that people, you know, watching this will get curious and start to do their own homework on it, just as I did. And a year ago, I was not, I can't, I have to say that this was not really on my radar. I was more concerned about running and operating my own business. But as I learned a little bit more, I wanted to learn more, more and more about it. Questions would come up, and so I would try to do some homework and more reading on the internet, talking to more people. And one thing led to another, and uh, you know, now I found myself being an advocate uh, in opposition to this whole process. You know, there's there's so many areas of it that trouble me, whether it be the non-disclosure of the chemicals that are used. There's a you know, there was legislation passed back in 2005. Uh, that says uh, that the oil companies don't have to disclose what they're using in, in the fracking process. Some of the economics of this whole, of the whole process uh, of, of the gas drilling. There's some interesting things. The second largest gas company in the country now, right now, Chesapeake Energy, could cease to exist at any time and be bought out by, other, by some other companies. And so there's some, some, some troubling things going on in this. A lot of people, when they read about this subject, will see Bradford County has been sort of a hotbed of activity, uh, the town of Dimmick, where there were a number of wells that were uh, polluted. I believe it's with, with methane migration into those wells uh, have, has occurred in Dimmick, Pennsylvania. So there'll be a number of references. When people go online, they'll see refer references to Dimmick and many of them. Some of the other challenges that, that exist uh, with, with the drilling is that in Pennsylvania, it didn't seem that there was a lot of testing of water and people's wells before the drilling occurred. And so when problems occurred, the gas companies were able to say, well, it wasn't, it was a pre-existing situation or it wasn't, basically it wasn't our fault. And that's one of the areas, and certainly if New York State were to allow this practice, there would have to be, and we would want to have extensive testing of all of the water wells and water sources that we have, just to have a baseline so that if some problem occurred, we'd be able to go back and say, well, this problem, this did not occur before the drilling started. And that's something that Again, all of us have to be ad advocates for. One of the challenges that I have with this whole issue has to do with the uh, stance of the EPA and or DEC. These are not elected positions. Uh, the people that run these agencies serve at the pleasure of Governor uh, Cuomo and or President uh, Obama. These administrations, both state and federal, want to see this practice of uh, gas drilling go forward. There are different issues of job creation, uh, energy independence, uh, tax, taxes gained, and general uh, you know, overall economic activity. These are things that they want in these trying economic times. The challenges there are is that these agencies then, to a certain degree, are compromised so therein lies a problem, and there's certainly a conflict of interest. And you know, it's something that uh, disturbs me in going forward with all of this stuff. My hope with all of this is that everyone who sees this film, I'm hoping that they'll spark their curiosity in this whole process, and that they will then be interested in doing their own homework to see, to learn more about this process and to become sort of their own best advocates for this, for the health, for their own health and the health and safety of their families and future generations. One of the things that's very clear to me is that there needs to be a great deal more study of this whole issue of hydrofracturing on many levels before it's allowed to occur in New York State. The health and safety of our families is just too important and also the health and safety of future generations is just far too important.
to rush into this activity without a tremendous amount of, of study. And my hope would be is that the state government and federal government can truly be our best advocates for the health and safety of our families in this process.